Welcome everyone to uh, this uh, uh, round table um, uh, about case studies from the Media Ecology Project. Um, I am going to paste here also a link to uh, the Media Ecology Project as I see that uh, uh, Tami, uh, our president Tami has already pasted a link to the uh, round table. Thank you, Tami. And um, boom, 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 boom. So I would like to introduce the uh, roundtable participants for today. Uh, we have um, Jenny Oy Oyalon Koloski, Assistant Professor of Media and Cinema Studies at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Jenny has published in studies in French cinema, postscript and in transition, and her current book project focuses on the storytelling function of figure movement and dance in musical. Then we have Mark Williams, um, Associate Professor of Film and Media Studies at Dartmouth College and uh, founder of the Media Ecology Project with John Bell. Mark has published in a number of journals and anthologies, including the Routledge Companion, um, Companion to Media Studies and the Digital Humanities, the Arclight Guidebook to Media History and the Digital Humanities, is co-editor of Rediscovering US News, Film, Cinema, Television and the Archive, and his book, Remote um, Possibilities, A History of Early Television in Los Angeles, will be published by Duke. Um, Right. Also, as part of our round table, round table today, we would like to pay tribute to uh, beloved and sorely missed uh, Paul Spear, um, who worked for nearly 40 years at the Library of Congress's motion picture and uh, recorded sound division and uh, retired as acting chief of the division. Um, Paul uh, left us last year. And uh, Mark very kindly uh, provided a clip of his uh, last public presentation that he delivered last year at Dartmouth College titled um, Biograph and Edison Standard, The Shape and Size of Things to Come, which is available online and, and it's kind of is part of a thematic thread within this co uh, conference about mutoscope and biograph films, um, to which also the brilliant biograph uh, films uh, are part, and we'll hear more um, during this round table. So I would just like to uh, introduce a little bit the uh, kick off the conversation. Um, and uh, uh, yes, so um, I would start with a general question for both uh, Jenny and Mark, um, which is like about what role have digital humanities methodologies and tools played, are playing or will play in your archival research and historiographic work? Jenny um, uh, presented a fascinating paper titled American Del Certism, Gestural Meaning and Crafting Physical Performance in Early Biograph uh, Films, which is also available online. She uses in her research various um, digital uh, humanities tools, including Media Thread, the ArcLight Search Engine, and Adobe Premiere Pro. Um, and I would like maybe uh, to ask her to focus a little bit on this, um, on, on uh, Premiere Pro. Um, whereas um, I'm reading from my notes, as these were really rich um, and fascinating presentations, um, Mark presented a paper titled Key Frames to Cinema History, New Studies of the Exhibitor Cal catalog of the American Mutoscope and Biograph Company, which is also available online. And uh, I'm wondering also again here about the role of digital humanities met methodologies and tools. And specifically, uh, Mark, once these catalogs will um, you know, presumably be digitized, scanned and digitized, how uh, do you foresee digital humanities tools and methodologies aiding the huge and overwhelming work of interpretation and analysis that, um, you know, the uh, MEP team and uh, scholars will and yourself perform on these, uh, on these fascinating archival uh, materials. So beginning with Jenny, um, if that's okay, um, what's sure. the role of digital humanities in your archival research, Jenny? Absolutely. Um, 
I mean, I, and I'm, I'm so grateful to be a part of the Media Ecology Project. And, you know, Mark and I have been playing with different ways to use these tools for a couple of years now um, at this point. And uh, for, for me in this presentation in particular, I was deviating from media thread um, in my research process, which we've been using a lot. And I talk about that in the presentation as a way of annotating um, and disseminating that data more widely for sort of collaborative research purposes. Um, and here I, I really was using tools from videographic criticism, which I do a lot of in, in my broader research. And since, since you um, mentioned Premiere specifically, I'll focus on that, but I can, I can circle back to the other pieces. Um, and for me, I, I like to think of a videographic criticism, you know, the idea of disseminating research through audiovisual means as opposed to written means. I, I like to think of that as, a, as an output format, as a way of sharing information, but also as a research approach. Um, and so you, you can see little snippets of that towards the end of my presentation of these little compilations. I, I mean, I guess you could call them supercuts, <laughs> maybe. Um, of, of these films. And for me, that was, that was really part of my analytical process um, that in, in media thread, you, you can annotate the films, um, but in this case, I wanted to be able to compare very similar instances of a figure movement and emotional expression. And I, I find that being able to take the film and, and study it closely through close analysis methods um, in Premiere makes makes a huge difference. Um, you can you can see patterns differently, and in some ways, I I approach research questions differently in that format as well. There's there's something um, really different about being able to um, play play with the films in that format as opposed to just sort of watching them um, linearly, I suppose. Um, and I, I will say as a um, as a side note, I don't I don't know if we can share screens, um, but certainly if this is of interest. Um, in the broader discussion, I have the Premiere file open, so I can always show more examples of that. Um, and so I, you know, I'll, I'll let Mark speak to the other half of that. But for me, the, the ability to work digitally in, in Premiere has really changed the way that I, I do my research. Um, and, you know, as much the analytical process as the actual um, output dissemination part of that. Yeah, that was great, Jenny. And, and believe me, we're delighted to have you part of MEP as well. You've been a formative, uh, formative collaborator. <clears throat> uh, apologies for my odd noir lighting. This is what I have here in my office. So uh, I, hope, I hope that'll be okay. Uh, digital humanities is a, an enormous question, a really important question, a pressing question. I, I do deal with part of how we frame MEP regarding digital humanities in the in the talk. If you if you check out the talk, um, you know part of uh, part of what how we interpret it is that we we want MEP to rec to realize what we call a virtuous cycle uh, by virtue of access to online archival content. We can grow new scholarship that's very interdisciplinary. So grow the field, but grow the field in such a way that we give back to the archives and we, we add value back to the archives. So we're also helping to save media history. Uh, once you get into the, the interdisciplinary scholar part, it uh, can be very, uh, very innovative and experimental. And we actually kind of love that. Um, another way to think about DH uh, really in a fundamental sense is that it articulates a dialectic. Digital, computational kinds of tools almost always invested in things at scale, huge data sets. Humanities almost always interested in close reading, paying attention to the individual text. It's literally a dialectic of approaches and methodologies. That is an opportunity. And for people in our field, and, and Domato represents a quite interdisciplinary range, for people from, from our side of the fence, we need to be there to realize the research questions with the computational people. That is part of our commitment to our work in the 21st century. And that's part of what we try to do with MEP is pr provide those opportunities to identify research questions, work on developing research questions, experiment with some of these tools 
And those experimentations, even when they're completely related to one another, such as the different ways we're looking at the Florence Lawrence films, might come together in some kind of whole cloth way, might not quite come together in some kind of whole cloth way. And that's why I love that, uh, the title of that new book, uh, Dialectics Without Synthesis. We, we, we don't necessarily need to bring things into synthesis because every one of those experiments can lead to new research questions that might have nothing to do with the synthesis of the original endeavor. So it's, it's, uh, it's very, very exciting work. It's arduous work. It's, it's not easy work. I think uh, we definitely don't want people to think that DH means you just you know, push the easy button and suddenly all these things occur. Um, but it's, it's so inspiring and really uh, compelling uh, to open things up in that way. Um, so regarding the, the exhibitor catalogs, uh, we, we almost wait to, have to wait to see what we can do with them once they're digitized. It, it's been quite a long wait for the Museum of Modern Art to uh, be in a capacity to digitize those catalogs. They agreed to it um, when we first applied for the grant and now it looks like it's actually gonna happen. And that will be, I think, just an extraordinary opportunity. First of all, just to have access, right? Access matters. Uh, secondly, to see how this new visual information, right? It's an extraordinary research. There's three keyframes for every film of the first 3000 produced by AM and B. And this means visual information for films that are otherwise lost. We can pursue any number of different pathways into what I like to call the fugitive history of cinema. This is stuff that nobody really has seen for generations. We can think about those comparative frameworks in relationship to an individual film in relationship to the entire catalog, right? Computer scientists are gonna to wanna to know, did they, did they determine those frames mathematically? I'm pretty sure they didn't, but so what, is that, what does that mean if they didn't determine them mathematically? It means that we can be thinking about, uh, sorry, my computer's talking to me. Uh, oh, heavens. We can be thinking about a lot of different research questions in relationship to uh, those frames. If, if we study all of those frames, are they gonna tell us something about how cinema thought about the frame? I'm, I'm sure they will. If we look at those frames in relationship to just the lost films and then the films that are still extant, do we learn something new by comparing those two, those two sets of data? It, will this teach us about how to study many other catalogs of cinema? Just thinking about like a three frame synopsis, what would it mean to make a three frame synopsis of the Lumiere catalog of the, the, the 68 millimeter I films, you know, many of which are uh, biograph. Uh, well, I guess they're all biograph camera, but not all AM and B. There's just, there's just so many questions that this opens up. And, and uh, it also, as I was emphasizing in my presentation, having access to them, you really do have a different perspective about the seriality of production and how that seriality suggests certain kinds of emphases or non-emphases. And, and a much more thorough sense of that seriality because it includes lost films as well. So any number of great research questions to pursue and we really wanna invite people uh, to participate in the project. Um, let me jump in again. I would just like to follow up quickly with a question that is related to the exhibitor catalogs and then possibly go back to um, Jenny's um, work with uh, uh, Premier. Um, so uh, Jean-Pierre uh, Sirotran um, asks whether these images from the catalogs, do we know whether they always have exactly the same framing as the framing of the positive films? Great communication. I don't think we do. I think, I think that's a great research question, right? That's something we could not have asked uh, previously because the, the catalogs have been roughly available in microfilm or you know, some not very uh, visually uh, precise media. <coughs> I think all of those are great. Uh, you know, do they exist to the catalog in the same way that like 
stills that are taken on set exist to the film, which is like not at all. You know, they, they might they might get in the similar position as the cinematographer. I think they're literally frame grabs, and we'll find that there's great um, uh, great equivalents to what's uh, to what's in the print. But but you know, prints vary. There there can be a lot of uh, a lot of fascinating historiographic questions that surround them. I think it's uh, I think it's incre incredibly fascinating how many things we can do with uh, with these images. How, for instance, we can use them to train image recognition software, artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, absolutely, absolutely, and that. Please, thank you, guys. That 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 is the chief way to think about digital humanities in our field, right? If we can manually annotate a sufficient number of images, frames, films, what have you, from the expertise of this society, right? From people who really know what they're looking at. That can help to train uh, the computers uh, to know how to see. This is a very basic thing. And, and if, if you like it, please cite me. Uh, you know, we know that vision is biological, but we learn how to see. Seeing is cultural. The machines have vision, huzzah. And they will see differently than we do and we can learn from that difference. But we also need to teach them how to see. And if we teach them how to see, they can do a lot of work for archives. They can make those archives more searchable. They can look at uh, reels that nobody knows what the hell is on them and help to identify them. It'll be transformative for the archive to work on this dialectic and make it work for the archive. So yes, absolutely. That is definitely one of our long-term goals is to facilitate that. And our semantic annotation tool actually does facilitate it. You can go back and forth, the, the, uh, the, the guts of the thing is robust enough. You can go back and forth between manual annotation and machine learning and the machine will put out all kinds of extra annotations. They are far from perfect, but the curators can go in and evaluate them. Oh, really good. Oh my God, what were you thinking? Oh, you missed one. And by the end of that process, you've got a sweeter training set and it can be a cycle of excellence. That's exactly what we have in mind. Thank you, Gracie. Thank you, Mark. Um, so going back to Jenny, I uh, just wanted to apologize. I forgot to mention your videographic, video, videographic uh, work, criticism work, and maybe if you have a link to a platform where we can view your, um, your essays, um, you know, it would be great if you could just paste it there in the chat. And uh, um, so, yes, some, um, actually many people are asking you if you could tell us more about uh, your use of Premiere, if you could share your screen and show us some examples of how you incorporated this tool in your research. Absolutely, I can do that and I can try and talk at the same time. Because <laughs> um, I think uh, I will, let me see, I'll pull up this project. Um, I mean, one of the things that I find interesting about this work is as, as I think I mentioned in the talk, I was working intuitively um, from a perspective of sort of choosing these emotional categories. And so, you know, I'm sure part of what I think my, my presentation reinforces is how culturally specific our understanding of movement is. So, you know, we move differently now and performers move differently now than, um, than they did you know, in 1908 and 1909. And so it's, it's been interesting seeing the kind of um, emotional resonances that I'm seeing. Um, and so I, you know, I'd be curious too, to see if, if these are, are perceived very differently by others. Uh, is everyone seeing Premiere? Oh, okay, great. Yeah. Um, so you, know, you can, and also for those of you that um, don't do too much of kind of this, this kind of work, you can see one way to organize this and you know premiere is designed for um you know filmmaking specifically but it's a great tool uh, for moving image analysis i think um so you can see that i've organized these into little little sections and just for those of you that maybe have the little uh, visual icons on the side i'll move this over so this is shock and horror was another subcategory that i found interesting and i'll just kind of play it you may be able to see little pieces of this um, yes. just to give another example, um, which I, another one that I found 
Interesting. And I will say that there, there are large portions of these films that are not in any of these categories because there, there didn't seem to be a sort of clear emotional resonance to me. Um, but you, you get a sense, you know, you can see some repetition, you can see some variation. I'm sorry, some of these are sort of smaller. But this is this is was essentially my working method. I, I went through each film and whenever I saw something that seemed to have a really clear crystallized emotion, I popped it into one of these categories um, and kind of went from there. So I'm, I'm happy to say more about it. Um, and I will, uh, when I'm not talking, I'll, I'll drop a link to my Vimeo page where you can see um, some of my projects. Jenny, can I can I ask a question? I, I put it in the chat, but I just yeah. to kind of gather some questions from the chat, and I'm going to ask my, the one that I have first. But um, I really loved your presentation, and I was uh, I loved your the difference, the distinction between hysterical and realist techniques, and the way in which breaking those down through using the digital tools, how you were able to to show and differentiate and show you know, and also looking at a very short period of time of one year. Uh, from yeah. 1908 to 1909. Um, so I was just wondering if you could say a little bit about that, um, what you learned in that process about the acting techniques. And um, I was also curious if you came across any references to symbolist or abstract techniques. Um, and I know you talk about how editing um, is was one of the, the reasons for which um, the hysterical techniques disappeared but were there ways in which, uh, did you see any kind of slippage into more kind of symbolist uh, or any kind of, uh, what, what was retained from those more um, abstract uh, forms in relation to the realist forms? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and you know, part, part of the, the periodization was also practical since that that's the time frame that we have access to the paper print collections and we were really focusing in on that portion of Lawrence's career so I would have to I would have to look into more detail and get back to you um, about later periods um, I mean I think what what struck me really was um, to a certain extent how genre played into that that you see in some ways a sort of broader range of motion um, in some of the the Joneses, you know, comedies, um, and sometimes a more you know restrained approach in in some of the melodramas or the the dramas, but but also how it it sort of crossed at at points that you have um, that in some ways it's really you sort of see Florence Lawrence's unique qualities coming through there um, to the point of um, was it sort of symbolist or or abstract methods? Um, do you mean sort of more generally in terms of of Film influences, or in the broader art sphere, um, yeah. Because I, I'm thinking of um, symbolist theater, but but I'm I'm uh, I'm studying the French context of symbolist theater and um, the ways in which those symbolist techniques still remained actually into the twenties. Um, so, so an arabesque gesture would would be, um, you know, it there, there's still it was sort of an abstraction that remained. Uh, even amidst the realist techniques. And, and so I was curious, uh, so, so certain of those techniques obviously disappeared and certain got translated or, or made more realistic. And um, I was just curious in the American context, what you discovered. And yeah, that. and in that case, I don't, I would have to go through my notes and, and maybe this will come up again on Friday because I noticed there are more discussions of performance. I didn't, I didn't see anything specifically um, that I that I can remember addressing those those aspects um, coming. I mean, I think I think you see influences from theatrical backgrounds certainly, and I think from Florence Lawrence perspective, since this is the first year that she's really working extensively in film, I think we could see a direct carryover of that. Um, but in most of my in most of my research, I was looking at the Del Sardian connection, but also other connections to, to dance sort of coming out of, of Del Sart. Um, I mean, one of the most interesting aspects for me from, from the sort of art and theater sphere and it actually was, was the tradition of statue posing, which I, I didn't know much about um, and sort of the Del Sartian connection to that, which is in some ways is more about, you know, the, the beauty of a certain shape than a, than a linear story or a narrative that um, I think Genevieve Stebbins in particular, I think was known for creating 
what you know what others have called a choreography of sort of linking them together, um, but in a more non-narrative form. Um, so you know, I think you see you see those little glimmers of those other traditions coming through. Um, but it's a great question. I'll have to look more into yeah, it and I, I can just, follow up. I just find it really pairs well with the digital humanities tools yeah. because it's about the isolation of the gestures and uh, that isolation that um, really changes with editing coming into play at that time and the, yeah. the transition and the changes in you're, acting. You're articulating a research question that we, we yeah. can definitely follow up on, Sammy. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and I think, and to that point, uh, any of those traditions where you have clearly documented visual examples that, that you could then translate onto frames, I think is, is a really great instance of what we can do with digital humani humanities methods. And then it's up to us to then figure out, okay, well, what does that mean? You know, what do we take away? What are the patterns that are interesting to follow up on? Um, but you, you see some of that with the Delsart material as well. And it, like I mentioned, unfortunately, we don't have a comprehensive lexicon, so it's maybe harder to pull out pieces, but you, you can see certain shapes that we could follow up on. So yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, that we could translate some of that. It, it also kind of echoes what Scott was saying earlier in the earlier panel about that kind of two-way street between the scientists and the artists, um, I think, yeah. Absolutely. Exactly right, and, and, and I was gonna also mention that what the digital humanities also provides, and this is a, you know, potentially a vexed possibility, is, you know, the capacities for the, what I call the subjunctive, you know. If we're going to have all those keyframes from all those lost films, hmm, what if we made them move? What if we learned from the extant films what could be uh, the missing frames? What if we took that on as an artistic possibility? Now, this really comes back to the panel about animation. Uh, how do we how do we imagine uh, the 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 frames that come between? That's a great open ended question, and I think one that could be very, very uh, uh, instructive across the disciplines. That speaks also to Ian's comment um, about um, the, the films of Robert Paul. He says they have 80 of 800 produced and he's producing a reference collection of frames from catalogs to circulate to archives. And he said there must have been a lot of unidentified uh, ones which could now be identified. That is fantastic. We'd love to work with you on that. Yeah, that's super cool. Yes, I was just uh, I was just about to refer to Ian's comment about uh, you know the um, the potential for you know um, for expanding uh, research methodologies and approaches, and he is also referencing his work on uh, Robert Paul's film um, catalogs. So, but you know, there's much more there in the in the chat. Um, there's so many other questions that are coming up, but I'm also aware of time constraints. So um, Louis was suggesting earlier to remind people that we can also continue the conversation in the forum section of the website. And uh, uh, maybe uh, I would begin wrapping up this uh, round table if, uh, uh, Tommy, what do you think? Uh, shall we include another uh, question or shall we just uh, continue like maybe a longer, more extended debate in the forum section? I think, I think we should, we should uh, let everybody uh, uh, offer a shout out to Paul. Yes, I think so. Um, there, there are a couple of really great questions there about, um, just to sum up, uh, I think that uh, about facial recognition software and um, fr frame edge markings, is are those possible to see in M MEP? But otherwise, I think we, we should uh, definitely give a shout out to Paul Spear. And, uh, and also I want to uh, let everyone know that uh, not only will the discussions be on the, the website, uh, you, you'll be able to see the presentations and go back and look at them again or look more closely. If you didn't have time to see them, you'll be those will be on the website indefinitely. Um, but I don't know if you wanted to comment on any of those, uh, Mark, the, about... The facial recognition thing could happen. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be much more readily uh, conceivable 
as these higher resolution digital scans become available and some noise reduction because the 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 all of those tools are made for uh videos that come from these devices when you go back in time it's a different object different object different object and when you get back to the era that we're invested in it's a really different object so but we're we're finding that the library of congress has been supplying some uh pro res and even higher resolution images and we we're hopefully going to work with some of the images that the iFilm Museum is putting out from the 68 millimeter stuff. That's a that's a different kind of terrain uh, to look for things. So that's uh, yeah. We we hope the facial recognition thing, which you know could help to identify lost films or films that nobody can really you know place. And um, edge markings, I guess, was the other last question there. I, uh, that that's not really yeah. my expertise, but of course, that. why not? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but uh, maybe yeah. I guess we could turn to saying something about Paul Spear, if, if you, Mark, maybe you could say. Yeah, something. well, this this NEH grant never would have happened without Paul, and uh, he came up to me at a Domator meeting, and said, you know, Mark, I think we could work together, and that was one of the happiest days of my life. Uh, just an incredibly generous, wise, extraordinary soul. So Please, much. others. I, let's let's have a chorus. Just just turn your mic on and say a little something. Yeah, it's so it's so hard to sort of condense like uh, um, you know just some thoughts about the generosity of 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 Paul. Um, I only met him like a couple of years ago, so I was a little intimidated by the task of you know sort of prompting a conversation that um, you know should be probably long, could be longer, but uh, I like Mark's um, invite um, to anyone who wants to maybe just, um, you know, share a greeting or a thought. I was just going to say, uh, I knew Paul over, what, maybe 15, 20 years or so. And, you know, I was still communicating with him about things that I was discovering and asking him about right up until really the end of last year. Um, it was extraordinary. I think what was amazing was the way he remained enthusiastic about kind of research questions. Paul was never anybody to rest on his laurels. I mean, her, his laurels were considerable. <laughs> and his uh, his book on Dixon is an absolute uh, monument. Uh, it's not a monument, it's an inspiration. <laughs> How you can actually kind of piece together a life like Dixon's with such meticulous attention to detail and yet produce a really readable book. It's pretty unusual. Um, that was a tremendous achievement, but Paul just remained interested and he had lots of projects on the go, sadly, when he became you know, ill and was unable to pursue them. Um, I just think it's a reminder to all of us, especially as we get older, <laughs> in my case, that you should not lose your um, enthusiasm for seeing new horizons, things that need to be researched. So Paul is, is fantastic. Never a grand old man, just a real enthusiastic uh, encourager of, uh, of younger people. And, um, you know, he went on asking questions. And his, his final book uh, about the Biograph camera, um, fingers crossed, is being edited right now and I think will be part of the uh, next year's uh, Giornate. Great, wonderful, that's very good news. Yeah, I'm glad, yeah. I also want to remind people we have tribute, a tribute to Paul on our website. On domator.org, at domator.org, um, we have memoriams. Of, uh, very uh, Paul and also Thomas Elsass are uh, the great scholars that we've recently lost. Uh, I have one other memory of Paul. Continue with Paul. <laughs> yeah. I have one other memory of Paul, which I should share, which is a domator memory. Um, it was in. Now let me see. I think it was hmm, the Toronto conference or maybe a Montreal conference. I'm pretty sure it was Canadian. <laughs> and Paul was giving a presentation about the invention of celluloid. Uh, it, you know, it was part of his great work on the beginnings of Mutoscope and Biograph and uh, Dixon. And he gave this incredibly meticulous talk about how the convergence of the arrival of sheet celluloid with mechanisms, viable mechanisms to transport it, created 
what we call cinema. And he was running away over time because he was going into enormous detail. He said, oh, shall I stop? And everybody said, no, no, go on. <laughs> it was uh, an example where the entire audience wanted Paul to keep talking uh, because we wanted to know the end of the story. How was it that these two technological developments converged at just the right moment? That, that's an example of just how, you know, how engaging he could be on, on uh, his home turf, as it were. It was fantastic. I, uh, I was just browsing through um, some memories that people are sharing in the, um, in the chat. And there's uh, Gwendolyn Waltz, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing names. Um, and she writes, Paul was wonderful about clipping articles and passing along bits of information. Delightful and useful surprises in my inbox, now much missed. And there's Dan Streborn uh, that uh, also writes, Paul shared all his notes and alerted me to the fact that there was a 68 millimeter paper print. Um, there's uh, Bucky Grimm um, writing, Paul, besides his wealth of knowledge, was so generous in sharing that knowledge freely and for everyone's benefit. I'm better for knowing him. Um, yes, uh, I'm probably missing something, but uh, yes, it's a really great way of honoring um, Paul's uh, Memory. I was also rereading the um, tributes on our Dometer page earlier today. Um, and uh, yes, um, I was just finishing reading the chat. Um, is, does anyone want to add um, some other personal memory or thought about Paul's legacy, perhaps for future work, uh, scholarly work, research, archival research? or otherwise we can uh, uh, wrap it up. Um, people can turn on their microphone. That, uh, yes, people can, of course, turn on their, their microphone and intervene uh, directly in the, in the round table. Uh, Jay uh, Weisberg uh, writes, I'm happy to confirm that Paul's last book will be presented at next year's Giornata del Cinema Muto, which is great news. And maybe just uh, just a little thought also for Paul's wife, Susan, who's been our Domitor treasurer for many years, and um, they shared happy years together, and I think that was also very important for him. Thank you very much, Frank. Absolutely. I didn't know that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, you got something? Yeah, I, I just wanted to... Uh, to, to say that when I was a, a young whippersnapper and fresh president of uh, Domator and I didn't know what the hell I was doing, Paul was always, Paul just came right up to me and started talking to me about this and that and about different projects that we could do and different things we could do. And he had this uh, computer, Susan's computer that he didn't know how to get the data off of that. And I introduced him to Mark because I knew Mark was doing, I think that is the introduction of Mark and Paul Spare, uh, and uh, and I I think that uh, I've never met a, a man who is so humble and yet so incredibly knowledgeable uh, about every one of his emails to me was several paragraphs long, filled with filled with so much footnotable stuff, right? And these are usually just. I mean, uh, so I, I will miss him a lot. I'll miss him a lot. Well, actually, on on his on Susan's computer were the data for the for Pathé in America. That's and, right. That's right. At um, Fondation Le Doux. Uh, I know. He, Pathé, so we, that I think we put him in the, touch with Stephanie, or Stephanie Stephanie yeah. somehow was working yeah, with that. We right? did. Paul and I. Paul and I. Uh, well, we we had the first conversation. I think in. At Northwestern, at the the dormitory in Chicago. Mm, yeah. Then later we we found a way to drive our cars to the Clark Museum, and take these huge honking hard drives and put them in my truck, and, <laughs> and bring them back to Dartmouth. And sure enough, they were able to crack them. And there was a lot of valuable stuff in there about about um, Pathé, about Gaumont, about yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I'll echo what Scott said that when I, uh, when I, even when I was secretary for Scott, and then when I, um, I followed up from his presidency, um, Paul was one of the people that just came up so quietly and said, well, you know, um, we have these files, we have this hard drive, and uh, he would like to just sit down at, at uh, Importanone and talk for hours. And, and, uh, and then when Mark came, we would just have these long conversations uh, about these things. And I always felt so terrible because I just, you know, there's always so much going on. And I thought, ah, oh, we just need to have like a whole uh, kind of uh, escape with Paul and just spend a lot of time listening to all of the knowledge and all of the things that he wanted to share with us. And uh, he is just sorely missed. Um, yeah, so just so grateful to him and his generosity and kindness and warmth. Right. Um, so thank you everyone for sharing um, bits of knowledge, personal memories and thoughts um, about uh, Paul Spear. And uh, thank you, um, Jenny and Mark, uh, for uh, sharing your work um, in this round table. Thank you, Tommy and uh, uh, Katharina for um, helping, you know, for contributing to the round table as well. And thanks to all attendees and uh, participants. And uh, I will, we will all see tomorrow for the third day of the Dometer conference. Thank you.